kind of talk. All right, so tonight is Sunday, September, is it 16th? Sorry, it's been a busy weekend for me. Um, we are starting our pop-up training tonight, and I am gonna go out to screen share so that we can um, work through our training tonight. So when I was putting this together, you know, I looked at all of the things that you guys had um, responded in your Google form. And to start our training, I felt like it might be good to talk about something that would help everyone with each thing that they really wanted to learn. And the thing that I came up with that I thought was most important was this, communication or connection. So we're gonna talk a little bit tonight about what the difference is and then how, why it's important and how to make changes and make it better within your organization. So if I say communication, what do you think? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Talking. I'm sorry, say again, Cindy. Talking. Talking, okay. What else, Kim? Intentional. Sorry? Being intentional. Being intentional with communication. Okay, what else? Information. Information, right. Anybody else? Listening. Yeah, listening. Expressing yourself. Yep, that's that too, Ex you know, expressing yourself. What else? All right, then let's talk about connection. What do you think that, tell me what, that, what comes to mind when you think of connection? Building a relationship. Building a relationship, yep, what else? Feeling. Feeling. Friendship. Friendship, yep. Hey. Partnership. I'm sorry, say again. Partnership. Partnership, yep. I said two way. Two way, yep. Well, the training that we're gonna talk about tonight is from a book by John Maxwell called Everyone Communicates, Few Connect. If you've not read it, I would highly recommend it. Um, some great information in it, and I think you would find it very helpful. Okay, so I'm getting feedback from somebody. So if you've unmuted yourself, can you please put yourself back on mute? So let's talk about why you want to connect. And when you think about connecting, it truly does increase your influence in every situation. So I'm sure there are a million things that you did today that you actually connected with someone on some level. And those are the things that give you great influence in that person's connection. So I don't know if you guys saw my post last night about having a bird in my house. So that really creeped me out. And today I was at the grocery store buying a steak and scallop dinner for my neighbor, the hero that saved me from that bird. And in the, when I was getting all the stuff for their salad, you know, I was watching a lady gather up a, or she was kind of tossing the heads of um, iceberg lettuce, trying to find the heavy one. And we got talking a little bit about salad and she said she was making dinner for her son because they're just coming home with a new baby. And I explained to her, you know, what I was doing and why I was doing it. And we shared a really great moment because we connected over the fact that she didn't like birds either. So with that connection, I said to her, well, so what time are you putting your roast in? 
And I turned the whole conversation around and talked to her about the quick cooker and told her how great it would be to do her roast and not have to be at the grocery store early in the morning to get that roast in for her son. So it, that connection gave me a customer. But here's what Maxwell says about connecting. He says, when leaders connect, the results are magical. Can you think of a time in your own team where you connected with someone and something really great resulted? I can think of one, Terry Pilat. Can you remember two years, like two years ago, maybe a little more than two years? Uh, maybe. <laughs> you were about to speak at Stacy's meeting with Jean Jonas in Baltimore. Yeah. And you were extremely nervous. Who, me? Yeah, you. Yes. But you and I connected. We talked a little bit about what you were doing. And because of that, we have built this amazing work slash friend relationship because of that simple connection. Sure. Becky, I saw you shake your head yes. Tell me some tell me so, about something that happened in your team where you made a connection. <laughs> well, a lot of people who know me know that um I had met a girl at a Pamper Chef party, a, a guest, and um she had always thought about doing something like Pamper Chef. She loved to cook, um, but she was a little shy and had some anxiety and never really Honestly, she never worked a day in her life except for in college. Like once she got married, she graduated college, she never worked. So she was very um, unsure of herself to say the least. Mm. And uh, after spending a lot of time, I, we met together several times. We talked several times. She did end up taking the plunge and giving it a try. And she was probably one of my top performers and we became best friends. And she's still my best friend to this day. Um, she's no longer with the business and I, it was hard for me, but she ultimately decided after several years that it just wasn't the right fit for her. Um, and you know, after a lot of conversation, I was okay with that, but you know, it really, what you say, it, it really is. It was a lot of me listening to her. We got close going to trainings together. We would drive together cause she lived five minutes from me. So any of us that goes to trainings, you know, actually drives there. We know that I love carpooling with people because it's such an opportunity to get to know our team, mm -hmm. not just about their business aspirations, but their personal life. And we had so much in common, her family and my family and some of the things she had been through. So we really had this very unique connection um, and we still do. So well, and when you're working with someone in your team, and Becky, this may not be the case now that she's out of the business, but when you connect with somebody, it gives you, it gives, it builds a trust bond between the two of you that you mean what you say and say what you mean. Mm -hmm. And that gives them a really good foundation to build on as you, you know, grow in the business and help train them. Yeah. But that connection also motivates hard work and it generates positive momentum. You know, think back to a time where you may not have had a good connection with your upline. Um, you kind of felt like you were out there all by yourself. And when you had that connection, then, there's that rekindling of the that work relationship that really does make a difference and trust trust is earned and without trust any relationship dwindles whether it's work or personal so be very mindful of that as you work with your team they trust you until they don't and getting that trust back is a lot harder than earning it the first time. Learn to build rapport with others at heart levels. Like, you know, we talk a lot about the heart tugs. That's what they're saying in the book. 
build rapport at a heart level because it does make a difference. But again, not only at work, but in every area of your life. Have you, I had a girlfriend many years ago. She sat down with me one day. We were just having a glass of wine, having a, a, a very light com conversation. And she said, what thing, what do you dream of? Like, what are the things that you want to have happen the most? And that kind of a question caught me off guard. But it made me think. And when she left, and it was quiet in my house again, I really thought about that. And I mean, it's probably been 10 years since she asked me that question, but I'll never forget it. Because it made me, it made me think about my own heart tugs. So connecting is all about others. And this is the really hard thing for us. And I think as Pampered Chef Consultants, it makes it even harder. If you want to communicate with others, you have to get over yourself. So often we think about what's in it for us that we forget what's in it for them. We have to shift our thoughts from being inward to being outward and off of ourselves and on to others. The best communicators concentrate on the needs of the audience and factor them in when delivering a message. So if you want to talk about something with your team, take it off of yourself and put it out there for them, and then think about what they need to buy into whatever it is you're gonna to train to, whatever that message is gonna be. Connecting goes beyond words. As a communicator, nothing happens through you until it happens in you. Whatever is inside of you, whether positive or negative, will eventually come out when you communicate to others. How does it come out? Positive or negative, how does that come out? Loudly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Maybe with body language. There you go. Body language. It's really interesting. You guys all know that I have a, a background with horses. And horses don't communicate verbally. Their communication is all in body language. And I've done a lot of studies with different types of behavior or um, how to train horses. And the one that made the most sense to me was the one that where the trainer learns body language that the horses are used to and they do the same thing. And if you ever want to test this, Walk up to a horse with your, with your baseball cap on forward and then walk up to that horse with the cap on backwards. You'll get a totally different reaction because they read that as a body language. When a horse is attentive and they want to listen, their ears are forward. When they're angry, they are pinned back on their head. And when you turn that ball cap around, that'll make a big difference. It's crazy. You have to internalize your message before asking others to accept it. So if you're going to so ask them to do something, you need to have thought it through and made sure, you have to make sure that the message that you're sending is one that they're ready to receive. But body language is the biggest thing with this because people read that a lot better and it speaks a lot louder than the words that come out of your mouth. So Becky, I have to tell you, or maybe it's not Becky so much as it's Suzanne. Oh no, wait, it might be the pair of you. This one made me think of you guys. Connecting always requires energy. <laughs> make a connection, a leader must expend energy to step toward the audience, both relationally and emotionally. Um, 
so what I'm trying to say here is when you really want people to buy into what you're saying, you need to have that connection. Think about the first time we saw um, Julie Kobe do that um, recruiting chat that she had learned. I think it was, was it Julie Aldridge that did it? Yeah. I don't know. It was one of the FDMs, but she really just sat down and got quiet and made that connection with the person she was talking to. And that's, that does require energy, but because that leader was connecting on both of those levels, it made it much more personal and felt more one-on-one -on -one and more directed at that person she was speaking to. Initiating a connection involves preparation and service, each of which depletes energy reserves. And that's why I said this takes energy and it requires stamina. But leaders must recharge in order to have that mental and emotional strength so that they can offer that connection to others. And here's what I was thinking about with this. When you've done a team training that you didn't take a lot of time to prepare, how does that feel when you go in to deliver that training? I feel how does unprepared. it feel? Unprepared. Absolutely. How do you think your team views that, Jennifer? Like I didn't care enough to put enough time into my preparation. You betcha. Do you think they can tell which one from the other? Oh, absolutely. You bet they can. So if you're, and I'm not saying that planning a meeting on the fly is a bad thing, because I believe that it, it's a good thing. But I think you have to watch exactly how you do it because you don't want your team to be picking up on that, right? So what can you do as a leader so that you always have the energy that is necessary to reach out to your team? Well, I know what helps me. But alcohol. Um, and and I think I can say talk drinking about myself on <laughs> what Jen? I said, are you gonna say drinking? Because that was my answer. <laughs> um, is um, getting my frustration off my chest to my upline and my up upline before I do anything. Yep. What else can you do? I have to have my balance and have my personal time away from Pampered Chef so that whenever I come back to it, I have enough to give. Absolutely, Jennifer. What else? This might sound kind of crazy, but as simple as going for a walk or doing some form of exercise because it really Jeff Jeff. organs. And it just, it puts you in a better place. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that is crazy. <laughs> I love, yes. anytime, I'm, anytime I feel like I'm not fully invested in doing anything, whether it's working out, cleaning, doing Pampered Chef, if I put on good, upbeat music, some of my favorite artists, I even have a Pampered Chef playlist that I listen to it, to my meetings and to my parties that just a lot of it is actually music that they played at national conference while we're walking in and it just gets me really energized yep. and ready to go so I, I think what what's important to recognize again is that we have to recharge and sometimes that recharge is just you know 15 minutes so what I tend to do, and this has worked really well for me, if I have coaching calls, I 
personally don't schedule anything before 10 o'clock in the morning. I like to be able to get up. Jen comes in at nine. It gives us time to look at our day and get our ducks in a row for the day. And then I can start coaching. I don't coach after three o'clock in the afternoon because by then my brain is mush. That's just how it always goes. But what I've also learned to do is I give myself more than enough time for that coaching call. Um, I usually schedule coaching calls for no more than 30 minutes. So for the first 30 minutes, I'm on that call. For the next 15 minutes, I'm taking notes, um, writing things down based on that call. And then that next 15 minutes, I'm doing nothing related to that coaching call. That might be when instead of take, just opening the door and letting the dog out, I'll go for a couple of laps around the cul-de-sac just to kind of back away, disconnect, and then I'm ready for that next coaching call. And if it's not another coaching call, you know, whatever that next project is, I've been able to kind of unload what was in my brain and then I'm ready to move forward for the next thing. Make sense? Okay. Connectors connect on common ground. What does that mean? Actually, Holly and Julie just did a really good job talking about this in the other training. So when you're attempting to bridge a communication gap, don't start the process by giving your opinions. Ask questions. That's the best thing you can do to find common ground. Instead, move to where that person is and try to see the world from their perspective. I try to do that a lot, you know, especially in giving someone grace. I think you just need to really put yourself in their position. You know, because a lot of times there's things going on that you don't even know about. That happens a lot. So when you're willing to see from someone else's point of view, that's the secret to finding common ground because you can look at a situation from their point of view. So connectors do the difficult work of keeping it simple. This is key. I think one of the reasons that um, some of you struggle with coaching, some of you struggle with meetings, some of you struggle with developing leaders is because it's looking too difficult. Mm. Keeping it simple really is a skill and it's necessary if you want to get through when you communicate. Have you ever gotten an email from somebody that's like a thousand words and you really only needed about 10 to get the information that you really needed? That's what they're saying with this. Shorten your message so that others can remember it. I, if I have a lot, of, a lot to communicate in any kind of an email, I will often bullet point the key things because our, our nature as a human being is to open that email and go right to the bullet points. That's where your eye focuses. Yep. And if you can give them the information that they need in that bulletin, bullet point, the rest of whatever is in your email, they're not even going to see. But if you try and script it all out, you're going to lose them. Stick to a main point and don't hop from topic to topic. Anybody else guilty of that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think. At times we have so much that we want to tell them that we feel like we have to get it all out in one conversation or in one email or one Facebook post. But if you can make one thing, one point first, and then come back a little later and do another, it's much better. It's a much better thing to do. And be repetitive. 
I know that you are, as leaders, you've all seen this happen. You'll train to something with your team and they seem like they get it, but then they don't do anything. And then they come in contact with another leader who tells them basically the same thing you just did. And all of a sudden they have this light bulb moment go off, this epiphany that what that person just said was phenomenal, yet it's the same thing you've been saying. That repetition makes a difference. And when you keep it in front of them, it keeps them focused. Good teachers cycle through the same information until it sticks in the minds of their students, right? Think about all of the things that you've lost. Let's just refer back to um, our follow retreat. What was the big takeaway from that? Above the line thinking. Above the line thinking. You betcha. You betcha. Now, that's an abstract thing that's kind of hard to really learn. But when it's put in that context with above the line thinking, you know, that just really brought that whole situation, that whole learning point home. So connectors also create an experience everyone enjoys. If you want to connect with another person, you have to be interesting. Now, in that interest, you also have to realize that you can't monopolize the conversation. It can't be all about you and not about them. And that can be a challenge for some of us too. People tune out when they begin to feel bored. But if you keep that conversation engaging, they will stay in that conversation with you. Learn about your listeners. Learn about the people that, are, that you're talking to. And you do that by closing your mouth and opening your ears. Ask curious questions. Not questions that require a yes or a no, but questions that require an answer, an open-ended question. Step into their world and communicate in a way that addresses their interests. And use illustrations and imagery to get your point across. So a couple of weeks ago, I was at a, an MDA um, discovery and impact meeting. And there were three keynote speakers there, and they were doing their best to walk around the audience that was coming in. But you could tell from the way they carried them, themselves that they were professional and that they were going to be working that night. It was a totally different look and feel to them than it was to everybody else that was there. And I think a lot of people didn't know what to say to them. Like, what do you say to a doctor? What do you say to the chief philanthropy officer from muscular dystrophy? And what do you say to a, a very handsome 26 year old young man in a wheelchair who has suffered through muscular dystrophy? But when I went to start connecting with them, um, the doctor, was probably, well, they were all very interesting to speak with, but the doctor and I connected simply because he was interested in motorcycles. And through that interest of motorcycles, I discovered that he gave up motorcycles and took up glider, glider planes. Now, my father had his pilot's license and his glider's license. So we really connected on that because he not only liked Harleys, but he also was a glider pilot. Um, I have talked to that gentleman probably three or four times since that meeting, and we're working on an event to marry the Harley group with glider training to benefit MDA. But if I hadn't talked to him, or if I hadn't been an avid conversationalist and really connected by digging into his interests we found three common grounds that we could work for work on and 
that um, that event that we're going to do is also going to benefit muscular dystrophy. So it's just a win-win, but you have to you have to be willing to make that connection. Stories have a much longer shelf life than an abstract idea. And Suzanne, that goes to what we just talked about there with the above the line thinking. When you can relate something with a story, it really gives people a way to remember what it is you're, you're talking about. And that connection becomes that much stronger. Connectors live what they communicate. Okay, think about that. Connectors live what they communicate. What do you think this is gonna tell us? Any guesses? Walk the walk. Look at that. Credible communicators walk the walk and talk the talk. What else? Um, it makes you uh, do what you say. Say what you mean and mean what you say. They align their values and actions. So people know, like Holly, again, on the earlier training, you talked about some things that are in your personal brand and that people would know about you. And whether or not they agree with you, they know what your values are. And they know those things that are important. Over time, people will note their consistent integrity and recognize their character. Think about that. So to your team, are you walking the walk and talking the talk? You know, I remember coming home from conference two years ago going, I am never going to grasp this virtual thing. It's just never going to happen. I am going to keep doing my kitchen shows and my catalog shows. I can't even think about this virtual thing. It's just not going to happen. However, my team was starting to jump on that bandwagon. And as a leader, I needed to understand it. If for no other reason, then I could talk about it. So people notice those types of things. And if you think you can fool your team on some of this stuff, you're the fool, not your team. Because they know. Earning their respect and getting and developing a reputation that makes you the leader gives the communicator credibility and it really gives them the opportunity to add value to others. So again, going back to the virtual thing that I didn't want to do two years ago. Now that I have, when I talk to somebody about it, I have, I can add things to them or share things with them that they can use. And it makes me that much more credible to that person. Connectors inspire people. Okay. So if you're looking to develop leaders within your organization, if you're looking to help your team get bookings, by connecting with them, you're inspiring them, okay? Leaders set the tone in an organization by how they approach their work and how they approach their people. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just saw Suzanne's husband in the background and it. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of that ambassador or whatever with the kids coming in. <laughs> well, and I'm also thinking about uh, somebody that I recently heard in a training that their husband walked by in the background without any clothing on. That's not me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We yes. see clothes. Keep the clothes on, dear. <laughs> okay, we have really like fallen off the, the wagon here. Sorry. So yeah. as, as a leader, they want to see what, what you're doing in your work. 
you know, and I know that I've told you guys this before, but when you hit a roadblock and you're struggling with bookings, you know what you need to do, but then take it one step further and say to your team, you know, guys, it was the 15th of September and I realized that I didn't have my October where it was needed. So this is what I had to do. This is what I needed. This was my goal. And it took me this many phone calls to get it back where I needed it to be. So not only are you setting an example there, but you're showing them that you have the same issues that they have and that you did exactly what you would have told them to do to get it back to where you needed to be. Okay. Through their actions, they communicate their character, credibility, and convictions. If a message is delivered on stage at national conference by a field development manager, and then a national executive director comes out and delivers the same message, which one's going to be more credible to you? national and why is the national going to be more credible because we know you've been there versus we don't know where the field person's been all right so that was a pretty lofty oh i guess i'm going to have somebody's phone aren't i <laughs> Oh, it is, it is uh, Karen, one of my consultants, telling me how awesome her open house was today. Sorry, I will mute myself. It's all right, no worries. All right, so because, because that credibility is important to you at National Conference, that same credibility is important to your team. So an organization that has a strong leader that is great at sales or great at recruiting or great at bookings, your team is more than likely going to be great at those things too because they see you do it. People need to be convinced of the passion of their leader before they will put passion into their work. Mm. Oh, that's a, that's a very important statement. Uh-huh. People need to be convinced of the passion of their leader before they will put passion into their work. So if you're struggling to get your team to do something, chances are they're not seeing you be excited about that very same thing. And wouldn't you say it's more effective if you do this on an individual basis? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, so there's all of the headers that we've just talked about. But again, when I was putting this training together, you know, I had so many things that I wanted to talk about on this first call, but I felt that connecting would make a better, a bigger difference all the way across the board for all of you, no matter what you're struggling with. Any questions about connecting? All right, I'm going to leave you with a story. This is called Johnny's Story, and it was told by Barbara Glantz, who was a customer service professional in a large supermarket chain. So during one of her presentations, she said, every one of you can make a difference and create memories for your customers that will motivate them to come back. How? Put your personal signature on the job. Think about something you can do for your customers to make them feel special, and that memory will make them come back. So about a month after her presentation, she received a call from a 19-year-old bagger at the grocery store named Johnny. He proudly informed her that he was a Down syndrome individual and told her his story. 
He said, I liked what you talked about, but first I didn't think I could do anything special for her, our customers. After all, I'm just a bagger. Then I had an idea, Johnny said. Every night after work, I'd come home and find a thought for the day. If I can't find a saying I like, he added, I just think one up. When Johnny had a good thought for the day, his dad would help him set it up on the computer and print multiple copies. Johnny would cut, e cut out each quote and sign his name on the back. Then he'd bring them to work the next day. When I finished bagging someone's groceries, I put my thought for the day in their bag and said, thanks for shopping with us. It touched me, touched her to think that this young man with a job most people would say is not important, had made it important by creating precious memories for all his customers. A month later, the store manager called me. You won't believe what has happened. When I was making my rounds today, I found Johnny's checkout line was three, time lo three times longer than anyone else's. It went all the way down the frozen food aisle. So I quickly announced, we need more cashiers, get more lanes open, as I tried to get people to change lanes but no one would move. They said, no, it's okay. We want to be in Johnny's lane. We want his thought for the day. The store manager continued. It was a joy to watch Johnny delight the customers. I got a lump in my throat when a woman said, I used to shop at your store once a week, but now I come in every time I go by because I want Johnny's thought for the day. A few months later, the store manager called her again. Johnny has transformed our store. Now when the floral department has a broken flower or unused corsage, they find an elderly woman or a little girl and pin it on them. Everyone's having a lot of fun creating memories. Our customers are talking about us. They're coming back and bringing their friends. A wonderful spirit of service spread through the entire store and all because Johnny chose to make a difference. Johnny's idea wasn't nearly as innovative as it was loving. It came from his heart. It was real. That's what touched his customers, his peers, and those who hear this story. So, how can we take Johnny's story and make a difference in the lives of our consultants. Wow, first be genuine. And whenever you think, I need to tell them whatever, tell them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's the saying about, um, typed words versus spoken words and missed opportunities yep but think about the just that little thing that he did changed the whole culture of that that store so when we look at our teams and we want to change a culture there's a perfect way to do it it Something reminds me of when you told us to send those notes from the soup book uh-huh uh-huh. Well, you're really pulling an old one out of the hat with that one, Holly. Right? She's got lots of things to pull out of the hat. <laughs> been around a while. <laughs> Thanks, Suzanne. Yeah, I'm only five years behind you. <laughs> so that's what I'd like to leave you with tonight. Think about how you can be a better connector, how you can connect, and the positivity that will come out of you making those connections just by doing something very simple. It doesn't have to be difficult. Any questions? Not a question, but a comment. Yes, ma'am. 
You know, um, I connect with a lot of people in the company, certainly not everyone, but I connect with a lot of different people in a lot of circles. And I think there's still a feeling of disconnect with these dot-com orders. And this is, you know, an instance where we could make a difference because I think these people who are ordering from dot-com are not getting our love because we're maybe not feeling great about the whole situation. So I've kind of, and this is just something new. I don't know if it's going to work, but I kind of was stuck with what do I do with these people? And I know that it can help me in the future if I connect with them. So I'm sending a postcard, you know, as soon as I get the order and two weeks later, I'm sending them a catalog and seeing how, you know, they're doing with their products. And two weeks later, I'm sending a personalized note with a scraper and a magnet with my card on it, connecting with them three times for these people who I don't know and do not have a connection with. And I just find that or I feel that this could help in us moving forward, but connecting with these people that we don't have a connection with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Terry, you've kind of taken the two plus two plus two to a different level in connecting with those dot com orders. Yeah. yeah. I mean, people go there because they don't have a consultant and you can earn their customer loyalty by becoming their consultant and just doing that reach out. It doesn't take that much. Just connect with them. Can I ask, um, Terry, do you do it even with the people when you get the note and says they don't want follow-up? Um, honestly, I've done it with everyone that I've received because okay. they're not getting my newsletter unless they want it. But. Right. Um, I am sending them because I feel like it's my job to at least make sure they're happy with their order. And that's what my postcard says. And the catalog is obviously they like the product. So yeah, I am doing it with everyone. I'm just not okay. adding everyone to my newsletter. Have you had yeah. any feedback yet? I've had two people out of about a dozen that I've done it for. And it's been very positive. I can't say that it's turned into a, you know, a show and then a new recruit and everything else, but just a good conversation over the phone that they initiated because of what they received is a plus for me. Yep. So that's a great idea. Way to... Sorry, Margaret, go ahead. No, no, I was just, that is a great idea. As a new director, I had no idea how far my dot com orders were going to come from. And it's really surprising me, but probably half of them have said, don't contact me or they don't want my information. But if I send a thank you postcard, it's just a thank you postcard mm -hmm. and reaching out. So, well, and I think we've all been very scared. I mean, I have, and I, I've got to admit, I have not contacted one of them and it's different from, I don't want to be contacted from pampered chef to I don't want any contact and we've got to get over that fear and say, you know, make your first contact, uh, uh, like Terry says, a, a thank you note and a mini catalog. What, what the heck is the harm of that? Mm -hmm. No one's going to go oh, crying out loud. Right. Yep. Someone might, but if they did, that's on if them. If they did, then they just are grumpy. They're just grumpy, and we don't need them in our lives anyway. <laughs> exactly, Suzanne. <laughs> All right, I am sorry this one ran long tonight. I will try to do better next week or in two weeks. Um, I'll post the recording back up. Um, thank you to those of you who uh, answered the question from Terry about the name of the book uh, in the chat. I appreciate that. Um, and... I will talk with you guys in two weeks. Good Bye. night. Thank you.